this session uh, that we're about to enter in is in line with the bank's new monetary policy communication program that it tends to enhance stakeholder involvement and promote transparency and accountability in formulation and implementation of the monetary policy uh, stance. Now you may, may you allow me to invite the Honorable Governor of the National Bank of Rwanda for his uh, opening remarks. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Bob. The Chairman of Rwanda Private Sector Federation, Chairman of Vassal, Vice Chairperson of uh, RBA, CEOs of different financial institutions, my colleagues from the Central Bank, and the other uh, institutions invited here. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for accepting our invitation. It's uh, maybe the first time we're inviting you following the Monetary Policy Committee and Financial Stability Committee, as just said by Bob. As you all know, we announced that we are moving into a new monetary policy uh, framework starting this year 2019. So from January this year, we entered into a forward-looking monetary policy framework using interest rates as the the main tool of our policy. And the underlying uh, pillar for the success of this monetary policy is communication. And the communication is not just through the media houses, but it's engaging key stakeholders in economic management or economic affairs. So that's why we invited you today. It is in, uh, in that context to engage with you as the key players in our economy. And we, we didn't invite you here to just tell you how we came up with the, the monetary policy stance we did or how we, what we see, how we assess the stability of the financial sector. But just to, to, to tell you that you are key players in this market, and we expect to be hearing from you uh, because we, we do our own assessment of the economy, we do our own assessment of the financial sector and based on what uh, the research we do and the assessment, uh, we come up with a monetary policy stance, a decision. We expect to be challenged by yourselves or at least to get more information from yourselves uh, to, to make a better judgment when we sit as the Monetary Policy Committee or even at the financial stability statement. So we intend to, to be engaging you uh, frequently. In fact, we are planning to be engaging you twice in a year. So we do our monetary policy committee and financial stability committee meetings every quarter. And in one of the quarters, it always happens around the time when we have the monetary policy uh, and financial stability statement. So. Those quarters where we have the statements where we engage you in a bigger forum, we don't have to call you here again. Uh, but in quarters like this one, and uh, I think that should be the one in May, we'll be inviting you to, to engage on the outcomes of the Monetary Policy Committee and the Financial Stability Statement. So we, we take you through what we see, how we analyze the economy, the financial sector, and uh, tell you the basis of our decision. And I really encourage you that from this, we hear from you immediately as we discuss here, but also even after this, take time, digest it, and we expect you to be sending us your comments uh, even later, not, not necessarily from this uh, meeting here. So you allow me to uh, take some technical assistance from our chief economist, uh, Thomas Chigavo, to take us through the presentation, and then we will discuss after the presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Governor. Uh, so uh, I'm just uh, going to take you through this very short presentation, highlighting key factors uh, which contributed to the monetary policy stance. I'm going to you at the end of the presentation. The second part of the presentation is um, about, as the governor said, about how we as a central bank assess the stability of financial uh, sector. I, I will not really spend much time there because that's your daily business. Um, 
one, um, when we have to decide about the monetary policy stance, we need to be sure that we have a clear understanding about all factors contributing to influence what we call market fundamentals. Uh, so that, that's why we normally start by the assessment of uh, the global economic outlook. As you can see uh, on uh, yes, on this uh, graph, uh, the global economy is not expected to perform well this year 2019 compared to 18, but we are expecting to have some improvement next year, 2020. Uh, these are uh, projection by IMF and the World Bank. So why do we really care about the global economy? It's because mainly we export out country. So, and uh, when the export sector is performing well, we can expect it to not have uh, uh, pressures on exchange rate and uh, limit the inflation path through, means uh, inflation coming from the fact that how Rwandan franc is depreciating. Th that's one, that's very important. But also because we import from the global market, we also need to know what is happening in terms of prices because uh, we are importing a lot, uh, as I will show in um, uh, uh, some f uh, slides here. The, 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 the import um, bill can have um, two main impact, one on e uh, exchange rate, but uh, uh, also on inflation. So that, that's why we, we have this slide, which is showing us really what is happening on the global economy. After the global economy, we uh, do some assessment on the domestic economy. The graph here is showing that uh, the Rwandan economy is doing very well, uh, with an average of 9.2% uh, uh, from uh, Q4 2017 uh, to the last quarter of this year. And uh, for the uh, 2019 growth, uh, uh, the projection is uh, 8.5, probably it's not indicated there. Uh, construction activities um, are the main, among the main factors driving the growth in the economy, but we have industry and the services also contributing really to the, uh, to the economy. But because monetary policy is, about, is a short-term policy, we at Central Bank have developed some indicators which uh, uh, help us to know what is happening on the real sector, at least on a monthly basis, not, not just waiting to have the GDP published by the National Institute for Statistics. So uh, that's what we call composite index of economic activities. You, you can see how the correlation of the real GDP is very high. So we are, we are uh, projecting to have uh, to continue having good performance in quarter three of this year. So we are waiting to have the National Institute for Statistics publishing the final numbers, but the existing indicators are very clear about the good performance to continue in this year 2019. Um, the external sector is the also another important sector we follow. As I said, because this has uh, to do uh, uh, with the behavior of uh, our currency vis-a-vis -vis US dollar. We have, uh, um, we have high import growth, 14.6%. Uh, That's the nine first months of this year. Uh, export performance, 39 And uh, this 39 is uh, mainly from Re-export and the other uh, and the other export, because the, uh, the 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 traditional export means coffee, tea, minerals uh, perform the not well because of uh, as I said on the first uh, slide, the global economy is not doing well. Prices of uh, commodity are going down, 
So, but uh, because the country has been uh, diversifying its export base, we are now already benefiting from the two other categories of, uh, of, uh, of export. So, the, with a uh, 14.6% increase in import, uh, and the 3.9 percent in the export, we we've had some pressures on um, on the depreciation on our currency. 4.2 percent uh, uh, that is uh, yesterday, and uh, this is um, slightly higher than what we had last year, the same period. So, but what is interesting here, uh, though the import bill increased uh, by around 15 percent, but We've seen more capital goods and uh, intermediary goods coming in to continue supporting the uh, the economy. Uh, we are expecting that in next uh, years we may have uh, more export from the investment we are doing today. Uh, another sector which is very important for us as a monetary policy authority and uh, definitely where you have a uh, big contribution is, um, is the credit market development. Uh, we've seen with uh, this good performance in the economy, but also accommodative monetary policy, which definitely contributed to have more uh, uh, accommodative financial conditions, and uh, also the development we have in the money market, interbank market, supporting good management of liquidity. Uh, this development led to high increase in the credit private sector. As you can see here, the, between January and September this year, new authorized loan increased by 41.1%. And this is from 0.3%. Uh, the, the same high growth is observed for the outstanding loan by 20.1% from 7.2%. Uh, so in summary, we, 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 we have observed a very high increase in credit private sector, supporting the economic uh, growth we have been talking about. And uh, another good development in um, what we call monetary sector, it's not only about the volume of, uh, of credit, but it's, it's more on the transmission mechanism of uh, monetary policy. It means how uh, monetary policy stands and uh, intervention of uh, the National Bank of Rwanda on the money market uh, have been really driving or impacting uh, short-term interest rate. Uh, but also it's not uh, shown here, but also uh, interest rate on uh, Treasury bond for 20 years, whatever the maturity we have seen, the interest rate coming down. And uh, also uh, on your side, we, on average, that's the, just the average, you have seen some good uh, trend in terms of uh, lending, lending rate declining. So all market rates here, the, the, this is the central bank rate can see when we reduce our central bank rate, other interest rate normally follow. But we have a band, this band, central bank rate minus two, central bank rate plus one. So we, we our objective is to have all money market uh, rate converging toward our central bank rate, but remaining in that band. So th we, which we have been able to manage and uh, as I said, the lending rate and, uh, and the deposit rate um, have followed the same, uh, the same trend with slight reduction in, uh, in uh, interest rate spread. Is it an improvement in uh, efficiency of banks? You, you know better than me, but uh, that's a good indication uh, of what positive things happening in our sector. Um, we also focus on inflation because this is uh, uh, our main objective. We need to keep inflation low and, uh, and stable. We've had uh, very low inflation, sometimes negative inflation 
which was not really good in terms of investment, but uh, uh, as a projected in, um, in March, we were very sure that the inflation will pick up uh, toward the end of, uh, of the year, starting by June, July. It, that, that's what exactly is happening. This is, uh, oh, this is, um, yes. Yeah, that, that's, uh, yes. This is the, this is uh, core inflation. The core inflation is the one excluding uh, fresh food, volatile items. Uh, you, you can see it has been declining, but starting by here, we have uh, upper trend. The same applies also uh, for headline inflation. But we have a band here. You can see a band. Uh, normally, we, our objective is to keep the inflation in this band to be sure that it's not very low to discourage investment, but also not high to negatively affect uh, consumption and the uh, other uh, economic uh, agents. So uh, we were below the band, but uh, starting June, we are now in the band. Our projection is that end of this year, on average, the inflation will be uh, 2.4 uh, percent, and the monthly inflation will continue to evolve around our uh, medium um, uh, objective or benchmark of 5 percent. So th that's the main. Uh, um, th that's the main sectors or factors we normally follow to take decision about the monetary policy orientation for the next quarter. Because the decision uh, we took yesterday is not to manage what is happening today, but it's to influence the market condition up to Feb next year. So as I said, the overall, uh, the average headline inflation is expected at 2.3%. 2019 and around 5% 2020. I think this is very important for uh, the sector also in terms of pricing uh, your loans and the take, taking other decisions. So we are not really expecting to have much pressures. Uh, and the 5% or 6% we may have next year will be mainly uh, because of the base effect. We've, ha we've had very low inflation uh, at uh, first six months of, of this year. So based on um, this assessment, the Monetary Policy Committee decided to keep uh, the central bank rate at 5% because it's serving us with uh, inflation managed, no much pressures on exchange rate, high increase in the credit private sector, good economic performance. So we have decided, the MPC decided to keep uh, the central bank rate at 5%. The next meeting will be in Feb, so in between, we continue to do the assessment of, of all sectors and see if you have new risks uh, so that we can be sure that we continue to support the stability of a macroeconomic environment of, of the country. As I say, the, the FSC, uh, that's Financial Stability Committee meeting, this is uh, well known by everybody here that the structure of our financial sector uh, with, um, th th I think this percentage of, uh, no, no, this is the number of institutions, uh, 16 the bank, but with more than 60% of asset of the industry, this, it's not uh, new information for you. Um, this is, this uh, table summarizes key indicators of bank and microfinance institutions. In summary, we are, we are okay, we are happy with what is happening in our system. Non-performing loan, because this is one of uh, the indicator uh, we follow uh, to be sure that um, uh, the loan we are giving uh, with good quality, we've seen the non-performing loan ratio going down due to different uh, um, factors, what you know no, normally. Uh, good, uh, good loan, but uh, 
also somebody alone removed from uh, from the the books so that we have a good numbers there so the rest to be honest this assessment by financial uh, stability committee is that the sector is uh, profitable is uh, stable and uh, we are not seeing no much uh, risk this year compa compared to what we have been seeing uh, last years. Uh, that's the profit, th that's insurance. Uh, to, to, to I don't understand what these numbers means, but it's about a profit. So you can see that profit are, uh, are very well. So thank you so much. That's the end of my presentation. Yeah, I think peace can, uh, peace can help me. Thank you, Chief. Thank you, Governor. Uh, I just wanted to emphasize, uh, maybe I will not go into the details of the numbers of what has been uh, uh, presented here. Uh, maybe what we didn't do justice is when uh, Bob was doing the introduction, he, he mentioned that we met to also assess the performance of the sector, but also look at the risks uh, in the sector and uh, what needs to be done to address those risks. So I thought I'd point out um, some of the key risks that we saw uh, emerging. Uh, most of you are financial sector players, so I thought I'd uh, touch on that. So on the banking sector, um, I think I'll just touch on uh, four key issues that we saw emerging there. They're probably issues that are common to all of us, um, but we continue to see a high concentration of, uh, of uh, lending to a few borrowers. Um, in our assessment, we saw that the, the, the composition of loans to the top 50 borrowers across the sector increased from about 36 percent to 43 percent. Um, the concerning issue is that um, there's a uh, significant high leverage uh, within those top 50 borrowers who we think that as uh, MDs that are gathered here today you need to be focusing on um, in terms of the performance of, 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 of these uh, projects um, going forward. Um, the other issue was a uh, sectoral concentration. Again, this has been an issue that we've discussed over and over again. A uh, high concentration on mortgage and and, uh, and and hotel. Even though we see that new loans going to these sectors are reducing, we're still significantly exposed to, to, to mortgage and hotel. What was concerning to us is that you'll recall towards the end of last year, I believe, we issued a directive on loan-to-value ratio um, uh, setting a cap on uh, on uh, uh, setting some uh, a minimum contribution of borrowers, especially in the commercial real estate uh, uh, business. Um, that LTV, LTV ratio required that borrowers in the commercial business contribute at least twenty percent towards the value of uh, the asset being financed. Um, and uh, for residential, I think for first home, first time home owners, uh, it was a hundred percent. But for anybody borrowing for a second or multiple uh, homes, that that LTV would would apply. In our assessment of uh, new loans that were issued during that period, almost sixty percent of uh, loans on which LTV should have been applied did not comply with that directive. So again, it's something that we are pointing out to the MDs that are here. Um, in terms of supervisory attention, that is something that we're going to be focusing on um, going forward. So implementation of the LTV uh, directive. The third is issue was on uh, deposit concentration. Again, it's an issue that we've talked about repeatedly. Um, and and it's, it's an area that we need concerted effort in diversifying um, the deposit portfolio of banks. Um, the last, second last, <laughs> in banking was the high level of uh, return off loans. So even though we're seeing a reduction in the non-performing non loans ratio, it reduced from six point, where are we? Oh, that's for MFIs, yes. And then for banks from 7.2 7 7 to 5.3, the NPLs ratio. So we see that ratio reducing. But if you consider the volume of written off loans that, that, that banks are sitting with off balance sheet, that ratio, combined ratio of NPL plus written off loans, has increased from about 16 point something percent to over 17 percent. So this is uh, 
liquidity that's tied up so we know the issues around uh, around collateral realization but it is it is a, an issue that we see growing um, and just as a reminder for the bank MDs that are here we have a meeting on the 28th of November to specifically discuss this I would request that just as a reminder that we attend in person um, so that we can see what uh, we've invited other stakeholders in this area so that we see if we can come up with uh, uh, measures to curb uh, that risk the last one is as we go into the year end, uh, we know that uh, attempts on cyber fraud tend to increase. We've already started seeing an uptick in, in, in attempts. So it is just to, to, to remind ourselves about the emerging risks in terms of cyber security towards the end of the year. Um, in insurance, um, three emerging issues, well, not emerging, they're really issues that we've talked about that continue to persist. Um, product performance, which is uh, maybe what Chief ran through the last, the next slide. Uh, we continue to see that even though uh, profits are increasing, the first slide, yes, the first table, you'll see that uh, at the bottom line, um, insurance companies continue to incur underwriting losses, which speaks to, to, to performance of the products that are on the market that needs to be uh, reviewed. Um, there's also still continued a high dependence on uh, motor and medical insurance, which combined represent more than 70% of uh, revenues of general insurance. So that's also an area that needs to be watched. And lastly on insurance is we see a growing uh, level of receivables, insurance receivables. Uh, we've come up with directives forbidding selling of insurance on, on credit, um, but we still have uh, about 20 to 30% of total assets of the insurance sector being insurance receivables, both premium receivables and reinsurance receivables. Um, I think this, this speaks a lot to the inefficiency that we see in the sector. Um, so I thought that I would just point out those, those emerging risks that we see um, in, 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 the, in, in, in the sectors that we supervise um, for the attention of the CEOs going forward. Thank you so much, please. I think it's clear for me also. Um, Questions? We can take some questions. Maybe a quick question to you, uh, Chief Economist. Um, so we have seen that um, a credit is growing because of the reduction in um, central bank rate. In order to make sure that we still tame inflation, where do you see credit going? Because if it is uh, credit that goes into consumption, we risk seeing um, inflation increasing and then affecting other parameters, including the cost of uh, deposits and um, lending rates as well. And then um, number two is um, to speak to my, my colleague CEOs. I think we have seen the impact of uh, um, the high import beer, but also uh, the limited amount of exports that we have. We see um, the role that um, exports can play in making our economy very stable. So we have a facility that we manage as BRD, uh, which we disburse through commercial banks to support exporters. Ideally, um, we should be able to support these exporters so that both the volumes and, um, and um, uh, quality of exports increase so that our export revenues grow. But we continue to see that we don't put in as much effort as we should. Um, I think this session should also be uh, towards morally persuading banks to help us in, in this. It's good for the economy, but it also has um, other advantages because if you see the impact of supporting exporters in terms of what happens in the, in the entire export value chain, you find a lot of impact uh, there, including um, small players like farmers, transporters, uh, storage facilities, and fine exporters. So you find the number of jobs created in that chain increasing, but also not forgetting the export revenues that you generate. So thank you very much. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, in our economy or businesses, we have about 97% of small and micro uh, businesses. But when uh, these small businesses approach bank banks, they are given harsh condition is and a very expensive uh, money. Uh, it was mentioned that 
most loan is uh, concentrating on a few businesses, big businesses. How can uh, the central bank or banks help to develop or grow the SMEs to the level of being bankable and able to get the loans? Or even how can they uh, be encouraged uh, to lower the cost to small businesses? Uh, my question goes to Dr. Kigabo. Given the low level of uh, inflation that we are seeing, because we saw that like even at, uh, during some time in the year, it went into negative territory. And the fact that it is really way uh, below the upper band of 8%. Is there a room to further reduce interest rates? I mean, um, especially we, since we know that now the risk is not of inflation. Thank you. Just clarification. Uh, I saw in some of the numbers you showed us there, the NPLs seem to go down, but then the next layer provisions seem to be going up. In my uh, simple understanding, it do not add up. Maybe the bankers know it better. Okay, thank you so much. Um, for SMEs financing, I think the question is for uh, commercial banks. Yeah, they can tell us what is happening and uh, what can be done. The question is very important for the development of the economy. I think the, the first question about uh, credit private sector growing, and, uh, what is the distribution of the, the credit we have observed in terms of all sectors of the economy? Uh, and uh, let me combine the two questions about um, <coughs> inflation being low. Why can't we cut further the central bank rate? So uh, these are two very important questions, helping, uh, giving me the opportunity to, to explain how the monetary policy normally works. Uh, we can't say that the high growth uh, in the credit private sector is a hundred due to the cut in central bank rate. Cutting central bank rate means uh, we, we try to be sure that the financial conditions are accommodative. Our central bank rate uh, and the, central ba and the um, interest rate on the short term instrument are very low so that banks will have more uh, interest to uh, finance the private sector than investing in uh, these short-term securities. That's the overall objective of a monetary policy by creating that kind of liquidity environment. Now, when it's about the decision of commercial banks to give loan, we have a list of other, number, other factors, the demand for loan, the quality sectors. So, but the role of central bank I think what you have shown in one of our slides, we have been very accommodative for the last two years, two and a half years, really keeping um, financial condition in, uh, in a way that banks will have more interest to finance the private sector than uh, uh, putting more money in, uh, in uh, the short term uh, uh, instrument. So in terms of uh, distribution, manufacturing uh, this year, uh, at least for the, the, the last uh, nine months, was the one uh, uh, taking a, a big, uh, a, not a big share, but the increase we have seen in the loan in the manufacturing sector was very, very high, but also we have constructions. I think the two sectors um, um, uh, have uh, shown high increase in uh, in terms of a new authorized loan. I'm talking about the new authorized loan. Uh, wh why not uh, cutting uh, the interest rate because the inflation is low? One, we, we've shown that uh, we, we, we've had low inflation rate, but uh, it has started to increase. And uh, we are already in the band. So where our projections show that uh, we may go around 6%, 7%, that's on a monthly basis, but on the average it will, it will be around 5%. So we, we can't uh, just decide today to lower 
uh, our central bank rate because the inflation we are seeing today is low. As I said, we have what we call forward-looking aspect, which is in, uh, incorporated in our decision. Means we, we are not dictated by what we are seeing today, but more by what we are seeing coming in the next two quarters. So th th that's why we have uh, kept our central bank rate at 5%. Take time to observe what will happen between now and, uh, and the Feb. Th that's how we manage uh, the, 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 the monetary policy. It's more, as the governor indicated at the beginning, we are, we are now in a new framework using um, interest rate as a, uh, as a key instrument. So in that case, we have to be sure that we have a clear picture about the future, and we take the decision today to manage and to influence the future. That's what we are trying to do. Non-performing loan, reducing provision, increasing, I don't know, peace and the banks may, may help to answer to the questions. Peace first and the... Uh, as understanding is, uh, I think it's more of a technical issue. As, uh, as, as loans become classified, and banks uh, take provisions, usually those provisions are considered net of collateral. But when it gets to that point at which you, you, you realize you know, it's time to write this off, then the collateral is ignored and the whole amount is then, uh, is then uh, provided for. Um, so it, it, in our understanding, that increase, the, the mismatch that you see between the NPL and, 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 and increasing provisions is actually related to the growing return of lo uh, loans. Um, on the, but maybe the banks can supplement. But from, from where we sit, that's what we uh, Thank you, Governor. Thank you, Professor Kigabo. Uh, we, we've seen that in inflation is uh, on the up again, which is, I think, related to the performance of the economy we are seeing. Uh, but normally in, in a, a period of high growth, normally there's also high inf inflation, especially if growth is, is driven by um, uh, activity in the construction sector, which is uh, a big um, um, uh, creator of jobs in, in the informal sector. So we're supposed to see more consumption and, and high inflation. How do you explain that we have high growth but still relatively low inflation. The question to you is, why are you not financing this? <laughs> <laughs> After that, I will respond to your question also. But, but Prof. I, I'm just repeating the question raised here. So. But Prof, you, you, you've shown us that uh, credit to private sector has increased. So we are doing our job, definitely, you know, clearly, right? As banks, we are financing the private sector. And even when we are financing big corporates, somehow the value chain, because the corporates will have suppliers, will have uh, transporters, etc., all these people get financed somehow. So we are doing our job, and that's why I think we, have, uh, we see high growth rates, but somehow it's not followed by high consumption. And, and, and that's a question that you know, we are trying to understand uh, uh, why. Okay, the answer is by financing uh, big corporates, SMEs are also indirectly financed. That's a good theory, I don't know. <laughs> Deputy Governor. Thank you very much, Governor. Thank you, Professor. You, you, you said what I was going to say, but uh, uh, financing the big 50, because the SMEs are also in the value chain. But the point that uh, Chair raised, uh, PSF Chair, I think the issue is with small and micro that is in the informal sector. Because I want to believe that banks today, when we get applications with uh, some level of formality, we, we are able to see the risk and assess and you know, provide financing. I think that the biggest issue is the informality around micro businesses. You are not able to assess the opportunity there's no historical data. There is, uh, uh, at best, some will present uh, the business plan in form of a contract or an LPO, uh, where we are able to get a thing or two to depend on. I think banks really do their job, as Jan said. Um, however, uh, it is improving. I don't think it's uh, where we were last year's, uh, just two years ago. Particularly those who are. 
the SMEs, the micro SMEs who are in the trade sector, I want to believe those get trade financing. Uh, those that have um, um, a bit of uh, dependency on, on a few things, for instance, those who are in the government uh, supply chain. Um, but the ones who are in the investment sector, particularly agriculture, uh, present a big challenge for us, and, and uh, we, we would love to. We would love because the issue that uh, Peace mentioned on concentration of loans is also a worry to us. But uh, how can we work, for instance, with um, the local authorities uh, so that we at least get a bit of follow-up? Because it's also not an easy job to follow micro. The cost of the loans will then start going high up if we have to go to micro uh, lo loans as a sector. Um, the other issue that I would want to comment on, probably Central Bank can help us, is to understand the future of circles. Um, the dependency on, on deposits is, uh, is, 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 a, is a challenge. Concentration deposits, sorry, is also a challenge for most of the banks, uh, including the one I work for. How do we support? We hear plans that uh, Central Bank is supporting developing of uh, another bank, cooperative bank or, or a circle for, a senior circle for the circles. Uh, will that exclude uh, uh, their relationship with commercial banks, wherever they be, they are now, because they are they are many in number. They they support many of us in in in, in mobilizing savings. Um, probably that, if we could get a direction where it is going, then we know where how to deploy ourselves. But I want to to, to also comment that uh, we've taken banks have taken a, a good stance on, on making sure that the micro um, customers are also catered for. I would, for instance, say um, we've started seeing growth in uh, mobile loans. Those go to micro uh, consumers or, or, or of loans. Um, much as the risk is still there, but uh, we started seeing a bit of a, a rise and extension of those services to the micro loans, the micro customers. I don't know what if I have answered the PSF uh, chair's question. We would love to. We are happy to work with you. Wherever we can get uh, uh, dependency on, on a few things, we'll be happy to, to, to play our part uh, in extending loans. That is uh, right, but uh, i just give you an example. Uh, uh, the corporates can get a loan maybe at uh, 14, between 14 and 15 percent. We find a uh, micro have money to approach the bank, uh, uh, maybe bankable, but it's getting around 21 percent. And the conditions and terms are also very expensive. How can uh, such a person come out? You know, you, will not, you, may, not, you may say he's a person who cannot pay risk, but you make him even more risk by giving him the loan at very expensive. So I'm just appealing to the banks to, to help our small micro who are managing to come up uh, to give them affordable conditions and the cost so that they can be able to pay. Most of them fail to pay because of that. You start with uh, maybe uh, a fee which is high, interest rate which is very high, management fee which is very high, and other costs. It, it, is, uh, it is happening to many uh, small and micro business people. Thank you. Uh, I just wanted to point out that the issue of SME financing is real. Um, I think we can't gloss over it. Um, but like Huntington was, uh, was indicating, I think it's, 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 it's a bigger issue than just uh, I mean, w li like Chairman was saying that they're getting 21% while the top-notch uh, corporates can get 14, 15%. The issue is what is the risk? What, what are the banks seeing that they're actually charging 21%? So I think an acknowledgement that there's bigger underlying issues. Um, uh, Huntington mentioned the issue of lack of a track record. 
Um, if there's no numbers to look at, you know, how are you going to lend to them? If there's governance issues, you know, what's, what's going to happen? So I think, um, and, and bearing in mind all these challenges, um, I, I also wanted to throw out there that we're in the process of uh, developing the financial sector development plan, third phase of it, FSDP3. Um, and we want to make SME financing a critical uh, sort of pillar in, in the next phase of F FSDP. And looking at who are the key stakeholders that will help to de-risk SMEs uh, and make them more attractive to, 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 to banks and uh, uh, other financial sector players. So uh, just to bear that in mind that um, when these discussions come up, I think it's important that we start to think, you know, what needs to be done uh, to de-risk this sector and make it more attractive for financing. So I, I want to put things in layman language. Uh, this uh, transmission mechanism that uh, you talked about, uh, it is expected that uh, monetary policy stance is going to uh, influence or drive lending and deposit rates, and therefore also uh, drive the growth in, our, in the real economy. What, what we see, at least for us uh, at Bank of Kigali, is that for, for, for deposit and lending rates to really come down. We want to see availability of long-term funding. It means availability of, of savings long-term. Not only should they be available, but also affordable, which is still not the case. We are not seeing in mass uh, the availability of, of funds that are long-term in nature. That's why even when you see a lending rates uh, dropping, I think it's mainly driven by competition amongst uh, us banks than really by uh, uh, the, the monetary policy stance. Because mo we don't borrow from the central bank. We actually get funds uh, from, from depositors. So I, I, don't, I don't know if you, in when you, you, know, you sit as a monetary policy committee, if you really feel that uh, reducing the, r the key repo rates is going to impact on lending rates. We don't see that in the, in the real economy. And how do we all work to improve and increase availability of, of long-term savings? I think it's, it's going to be critical if we are to reduce uh, deposit, but also uh, lending rates as, as we all wish to. Thank you. I, I think mine, I just wanted to add on the debate around the SMEs. I'm not sure about the interest rate of 21%. I'll not comment on that, uh, but I think there is a need for us to continue the capacity building for SMEs. I think what we tend to see is that an SME will come to you and say, I have this great collateral value, that this and this, and they think that should be the only basis, I guess, which you should consider their lending. Uh, they ignore the fact that, you know, the first way out for most banks, obviously, is, is your cash flow. Uh, second way out, we all know the challenges around that. So I think there's, there's still a very, very big need to, to really change the mindset and create a lot of capacity building for people to understand that, you know, first way out is the cash flows, how should they be presenting that, they should be thinking about the viability of the business, rather than simply assuming that, you know, I have this great collateral, then, you know, why should, I mean, I keep getting that all the time, you know, why are you not, uh, you know, looking at my collateral? So I think really that space is still a very, very big challenge in, in terms of the mindset. Uh, my question goes to, uh, to peace. Um, I like the clarifications you, 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 you gave after the presentation uh, where you listed um, issues affecting the banking uh, industry and uh, the insurance uh, industry. Um, uh, my question is, uh, could you do the same for the microfinance uh, subsector? Thank you. The, the first question was the kind of uh, disconnection between high economic growth and uh, and the low inflation. Yeah, normally in textbook, when you have uh, high growth, you, ha you 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 will have high inflation pressures on on the prices. But it depends on uh, what has been driving the high growth. Uh, as uh, we indicated here, construction played a big role in the, the growth of um, quarter one and the quarter two of this year. Uh, I think construction increased by more than 33%. And this construction sector, which is a key driver of the high growth, is more import dependent. 
so that the sector which is pushing the economy to grow is not putting pressures on the domestic prices either for input uh, or labor. So that, that, that's one of, uh, of, of the reason normally. Uh, but as you rightly said, you have seen the inflation um, uh, starting to pick up uh, now 4.4% uh, last month. I think the, uh, uh, the activities in other sectors have started really to, you know, to have some pressures, good pressures on, uh, on, on, uh, on the prices because people are getting money and do other businesses. The, the second question is uh, is very interesting, the transmission mechanism. I think uh, one of the factors limiting our transmission mechanism is the structure of commercial banks. Uh, our commercial banks, the, the sector is not competitive. Uh, because competitive means what? Competitive means uh, nobody is able to decide to increase price, lending rate. I'm very sure a bank can decide to increase lending rate and the people will continue to come and they have a loan there. So I think when you have uh, competition, this facility of a player to decide about increase, uh, the probability is around zero. So, but le let me explain how the transmission mechanism here works. One, by reducing our central bank rate, as we said, the, we have what we call uh, uh, interest rate path through. We st the first uh, block is to be sure that we are impacting the short-term interest rate. And um, uh, I will respond to your question. Suppose you are not borrowing from uh, central bank, which is not true now. We have started to inject our money. Um, uh, but I will come uh, to, to that aspect. Suppose we are really not providing is a, even a zero franc to banks, but we are able to influence interest of some of your investment in the treasury bills, uh, in repo operations. We are already influencing your behavior when you have to decide about how much to, to, to give us loan and at the how, uh, how, how much cost. And I think if you have been observing the trend in um, treasury bill rate, that's from one to 12 a month, uh, even the uh, treasury bond for three months, uh, three years to 20 years, all these interest rates have been reducing. So as a result, suppose you are a bank in a competitive market, you are mobilizing deposit, you need, you, we are expecting if you are rational in the in a competitive market the, the the lending rate may react to the change because you are you are you are collecting deposit to invest in uh, the instrument where you are seeing the interest rate uh, changing but also you are supposed to reduce your your lending rate because uh, uh, other opportunities have been uh, um, the, the interest rate on other instruments have been reducing. So that, that's how the transmission mechanism normally work. But because of uh, the, the nature of the banking system, which is not uh, competitive, but competitive, it's not a, pro, it's not a let me say, a, a fault of banks. But look, the credit private sector has a percentage of GDP today in Rwanda is around 30%. So it means we have other economic issues which by improving progressively will uh, lead to high rate of credit private sector means the economy offering more business opportunities for banks and this will really improve the transmission mechanism but we are what we are seeing today is already encouraging please i think you have uh, you are ready so to address uh, maybe i'll address the two questions that were asked about uh, circles both by huntington and uh, emma starting with the, the risks that we see in the microfinance sector um, a, a lot of the risks that are in the microfinance sector are very similar to what we see in the banking sector so the issue of npls and high level of written off loans is is, is similar to what we see um, 
uh, in the banking sector. Um, maybe what is specific to to uh, this sector is within the the Umrenje Sako subsectors. Um, again, it's issues that we've discussed over and over again, the issues around governance and uh, management practices and skills and capacity uh, within uh, the, the, the subsector. Um, but also, uh, even though we've seen a reduction in the trend of embezzlement, funds embe embezzled in, uh, in, in, in Omrenje circles, they still have a, a, a huge, they're sitting on a, on, 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 uh, a huge uh, sort of suspense account of these, these amounts that have been stolen and are out there. Um, you'll recall through the Bushichirano, yeah, in December last year, there was a, spe a specific task force that was put in place um, of key stakeholders, the central bank, local government, REB, police, uh, defense forces, you know, all these people that, you know, came together to, to, to address this issue because it was becoming almost like a habit, you know, um, get into a management position in a circle, get comfortable with the, with, with the, with the people and processes and places, and then, you know, clean uh, the accounts, maybe 10, 20 million francs and just disappear. And the next thing you hear, people have been released, they're walking around, and, you know, it was beginning to catch on as a, as, as a, as a practice. So that initiative uh, has been very, very, uh, has sent a, 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 a resounding message um, that this is something that will not be tolerated, and we expect to see that declining going forward. But that has been a significant risk in the Umrenje Sarko's um, space. Um, the issue when we, we look at the limited liability companies, I think the, the biggest issue we see there is operational efficiency um, and how that can be turned around to make the companies uh, uh, operate more, more profitably. Um, to uh, Huntington's question about uh, the plans for Umrenje circles, um, I think the most immediate uh, thing that is, is going on right now is the automation of, uh, of the circles. Um, because you know we all know that, that, that they're running on manual systems and that makes them you know more susceptible to to fraud and things like that um, so right now what is happening is to automate the 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 the, the, the system the, the system um, and we're at a place of uh, testing a pilot with at least three of the circles and um, the issue of consolidating the circles uh, still is on the table and the idea is to eventually have uh, have them work in a, I don't want to say a closed loop because then that sounds like they're closed off the rest of the system. Um, but to, 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 to put a framework in place, and it's not just for liquidity management, which uh, I guess is a, uh, is a potential risk that the banks have to be uh, prepared for, but also to put in, uh, in, uh, in place a system that helps them with regard to internal controls, with regard to um, you know, policies and procedures and things like that uh, to, 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 to make them more efficient. So in terms of uh, liquidity, I guess it, it, it is a potential risk. Um, I cannot put a date though to when that consolidation will be happening, but it, it, it is something that's in the works. A uh, quick question. Uh, where do you see the projection for the foreign exchange uh, for 2020, given the big gap uh, on exports uh, versus uh, imports? It will definitely have an impact on the supply of foreign cur currency, especially on the, on the dollars. Maximum 5% depreciation in 2020. That's our projection. I think I've done my work, so, Governor. Yeah, thank you, Professor. Uh, I'd sought your technical assistance in making the presentation, but as as a teacher, as a lecturer, it was easier for you to, to even coordinate the the comment and question session. So thank you for uh, for handling it quite well. Uh, so as we conclude, I want to thank you for again for accepting our invitation. This is just the beginning. Uh, I'm sure when you, are, you received the invitation, you're wondering why we wanted to to offer you lunch. It's not really normal that uh, the central bank <laughs> that the central bank gives lunch to the to the regulated institutions. Uh, now that you know, uh, take time as you digest your lunch, digest what we've discussed here, and uh, going forward, we, as I said, we expect to receive uh, comments from yourselves, ideas, and. Uh, 
but even next time when we meet, maybe we even be uh, more prepared. But I appreciate the discussions we've had here, questions of why didn't you increase, reduce further your, your policy rate since we had low inflation. And I think uh, our chief, we call him chief, he's chief in everything, uh, from being chief economist, but he ends up being chief anyway. So he, he answered that quite well, that we, we we're in a forward-looking uh, framework. We see what is happening, what is coming f ahead of us. And that's where we really want you to, to be part of this game because we, we get the numbers from yourselves uh, and we put together, we try to project what is coming. And we need to be hearing from yourselves exactly what do you see, what, what do you think is coming ahead of, uh, that, that could change how we think the economy will will behave and therefore could influence on the decisions we are taking. So I think that's very key. Uh, so interesting discussion, I thank you for that. Diana asked a question on the savings and how that would impact on, on the pricing. Uh, but maybe I want to throw back the question to you as well. As, as financial institutions, uh, I think we also expect you to, to be creating channels to promote savings. While it's the government is doing coming up with some initiatives. But I also think with the, with the, as financial institutions, you can also help to drive uh, savings and therefore create long-term capital. Uh, and what uh, uh, Annington said, these digital channels, maybe these are some of the channels that you can use. It might be small, but at least you, you, you're tapping the, the idle money sitting in people's pockets or uh, there to, to, to come into the, the, the loop and uh, you are able to to build these uh, savings. We are here as financial sector players. We we we, we can be uh, open to ourselves. I remember last time when we met the banking industry and talking about creating channels for savings and uh, uh, promoting long-term uh, deposits. Unfortunately, it seemed to be not interested in things that could add cost to you. It's, uh, I, I don't know how that sounded f to us. We thought, as you rightly said, Diane, we thought you needed long-term deposits that would give you comfort and therefore enable you to be able to issue long-term loans with maybe price your, 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 your loans better as well. But I think that time, I remember when Selena People seem to be enjoying the short-term free money, and uh, but it can't, as you rightly said, I don't think that would be helpful if you want to do long-term planning and long-term long uh, loans. So I, I think we, we, as we always say, we're not just a, a regulator, we're an enabler as well. So where we can play a role in this, well and good. Uh, but I think, again, uh, Chigawa talked about how we can influence the lending by if we reduce the money market rates and your options of investing in risk-free uh, other assets uh, are limited or are very cheap, then you you are encouraged, you're enticed to take, to look at uh, maybe risky uh, projects that could earn you more money. So it's, it's we're all working together. We, we know the transmission mechanism is still weak. Uh, but when you look at what has happened in the, sh in the last two years with the money market rates, the trend we see on the lending rates, why there are other factors there, but we think we want to link it again to what has been happening in the economy that is linked to also what the, the monetary policy stance has been doing. So we really want to, to generate uh, serious discussions. Uh, we, we told when you come here, we look at you as key players in this economy, not as regulated institutions. And don't talk to us as your regulator, talk to us as your colleagues, your managers of the economy. So <laughs> please, that's the spirit we want to be conducting this, these sessions. We, we, we want to, to be openly hearing from your challengers. As I said, we might be misunderstanding what is happening, so challenge us and let's have a common understanding of where this economy is going. Uh, we thank you again and wish you well. Thank you.